You're about to see a classic David versus Goliath battle in Norway. David will be played by this Arctic turn. And Goliath will be portrayed by this mammoth, ferocious, and quite hungry polar bear. To the victor go this fresh pair of speckled turn eggs. So how does this turn stop this bear from eating its eggs? By attacking the bear in its most vulnerable spot. Its nose. Wow, let's see that again in super slow-mo. Hey, that's gotta hurt. The nose and the pride. And since one good turn deserves another, David beats Goliath again. Because David's aim is just about perfect. We're in Yellowstone National Park. Both a male and female American Dipper here will go to virtually any lengths or depths to feed their young. This one has a hungry chick, and that means it's always looking for food. Now, that's not unusual. What is unusual is where it hunts. The Dipper dines on aquatic insects. How does a bird like this get enough bugs to feed the family? Well, not by scouring the surface. Nope, the Dipper flies underwater. That's where the best hunting is. That's where the Dipper finds dinner for its ravenous family. This Dipper wears its own natural down jacket under those feathers, so it can dive in the iciest waters. Because of its size and wing power, it can forage in currents that would carry away the average sport fisherman. Indeed, the Dipper puts a human fisherman to shame. It doesn't just throw a hook out there and hope for the best. It dives, it searches, it hunts. And when no prey can be seen, its narrow beak prods and pries at the pebbled riverbed for such delectables as the giant stonefly or the shrimp-like scud. The Dipper goes after these bugs with laser-like focus and military efficiency. You can hide at the bottom of a river, but you can't fool a parent with hungry chicks to feed. Ha <laughs> no way. These tuxedoed waddlers are emperor penguins. You may not know it, but these semi-aquatic birds are some of the most dedicated parents in the animal kingdom. I mean, would you be willing to do what they do? Spend 65 days huddled here in this penguin pack in temperatures that can drop to 112 degrees below zero with winds of 50 miles an hour? Even Green Bay Packer football fans don't have it this bad. Fortunately, these big birds have evolved dense feathers and a thick layer of body fat. The remarkable thing is, the one who incubates the egg in a brood pouch is Dad. Meanwhile, Mom goes off to sea looking for food. Even after the baby is hatched, it's Dad who keeps the baby in the brood pouch. Good thing, too. Just two minutes in the elements, and the chick would be a goner. Once Mom comes back, she and Dad take turns heading out for more food. Since they aren't mammals, they can't feed their babies with milk. Instead, they have to make long, often arduous treks to fishing holes, where they can be faced with huge, hungry, up to 1,300-pound leopard seals. Once the coast is clear of predators, the penguins dive deep and look up to find fish swimming just under the ice. They're impressive predators. And equally impressive at evading predators. Then, back at the rookery, the parent finds his own chick by voice recognition. Parent calls. And baby answers. Once they're reunited, Baby gets to chow down on regurgitated fish. 
As the baby grows up, mom and dad eventually hunt for its nourishment together. So, remember that huge, seemingly anonymous group of emperor penguins? Well, groups like that are made up of committed parents working in tandem. Great parents. Lucky kid. We're here in the Svalbard Islands of Norway to observe one of the most astonishing, breathtaking daredevil initiation rites on the planet. Thousands of guillemots are nesting on these sheer rock cliffs, far beyond the reach of predators. Now, here's the daredevil part. The guillemots are more at home in the ocean than on the cliffs. The chicks have hatched, and they have to fly to that ocean, only they've never flown before, ever. Imagine you're this guillemot chick. You've never flown. You don't even know what it's like to fly, or if you can fly. Below you, jagged cliffs, ready to impale you if you fail. Several hundred feet down in the water, adults squawk encouragement to you. Remember your very first time up on that high dive, alone with everyone watching? Multiply that by a thousand. You're never really ready. You just have to, well, you know, take the plunge. You plummet down at first, toward your death on the rocks. But other adults are following you, guiding you, showing you the way. You don't fly exactly, but you do glide. You use those wings just enough to stay with the adults and clear the rocks. You made it! You skip like a pebble on the water. And then, exhilaration. Other chicks follow your lead and take the plunge too, until your whole water-loving species is where it belongs. May in Lancaster Sound in northern Canada. And the thick-billed muirs gather for their annual spring fling all-you-can-eat fish fest. If you were to judge this bird by how it flies, you'd have to say it's no great shakes compared to other similar animal aviators. You know, small wings, big body. It makes some maneuvers challenging. So why should you care if hundreds of thousands of thick-billed muirs gather here in Lancaster Sound? Because as mediocre as these birds are at landing, that's how spectacular they are underwater. With their short, flipper-like wings, the muirs can plummet to a depth of 300 feet and stay underwater for up to three minutes at a time. The best show of all is the muirs on their way back up. The air trapped in their feathers expands, allowing them to rocket to the surface in a jet trail of bubbles. See, they're actually great aviators. They just do their best flying underwater. This white-crowned plover may be small, but it's fierce especially when it comes to family. Here in Kruger National Park in South Africa, the plover has to defend its home against huge, oblivious animals that could stomp the nest without even realizing it. As if a no-clue croc isn't threatening enough, some heedless hippos imperil the nest. Well, safe so far. But then this baboon accidentally wanders too close to the nest. Aha! Confronted with a potential threat it can deal with, the plover can now fly into action. The best defense is truly a good offense. The baboon tries to fight back, but the plover is fighting for its young ones. Now, 
a hungry Nile monitor lizard appears. The monitor may be the worst menace of all, since it's looking to devour those eggs. The plover mounts a fierce defense. It becomes precision dive bomb pilot, airplane, and guided missile all in one. Now, honestly, would you have bet this little bird could thrash this hungry lizard? Well, it's no contest. However, in protecting its young, the plover faces one last enemy, extreme temperature. This sand can heat up to 120 degrees, and that seems hot enough to fry these eggs. For this defense, mom and dad take turns wetting their feathers and then covering the eggs. Every 10 minutes, they switch off. Isn't it amazing how much effort mere survival can take? Get ready to duck. We're inside a tree 15 feet above a lake high in the Rocky Mountains. We're in a nest of wood duck eggs, hatching after a 30-day incubation. And we're here to witness a rite of initiation that is, at once, daunting and amazing. Even though the mom duck laid her 11 eggs on different days, she didn't start sitting on them till they'd all appeared. That way, they'd all hatch on the same day. The hatchlings get to spend their first night in the nest. One night, that's it. Enjoy yourselves, because tomorrow morning comes the big ordeal. Tomorrow morning arrives in a hurry. When the hatchlings first gaze at their mother, she's 15 feet below, calling for them to <coughs> gulp, jump down to her. Can you imagine how much courage you'd need to take the plunge to mama? Your first day on the planet, never flown before, now having to leap the human equivalent of 30 feet or more. Wow, made it. None the worse for wear. The truth is, 15 feet isn't that big a deal. Some hatchlings have to leap 60 feet. Why would these hatchlings take such a leap? Well, if they stay in the tree, they starve to death. Yeah, that sounds like motivation to me. Mom and her 11 little hatchlings. After a rite of passage like this one, they're ready for absolutely anything. Okay, class, what do we know about sea anemones? Beside the fact that the word anemone is fun to say. We know that sea anemones like these in the Great Barrier Reef of Australia usually attach themselves to rocks or coral. We know that they have tentacles with nematocysts, stinging cells that paralyze and entangle small marine animals. We know that the entire point of having tentacles with nematocysts is to sting, paralyze, and then consume, with gusto, fish exactly like these clownfish, which, to all intents and purposes, appear to be making a complete mockery of this entire process. Not only are the clownfish cavorting amid these tentacles with seeming impunity, they are actually using the tentacles for shelter. They are using the predator's weapons for their own protection. Now, how can this be? In a word, mucus. Clownfish are able to live most of their lives amid these toxic tentacles because they coat their bodies with their own mucus. For reasons that are a mystery, even to scientists, the mucus apparently keeps the anemones from recognizing the clownfish as dinner, so they don't release their venom to attack. 
Amazing what a lot of ingenuity and a little slime can do. If you've spent any time at the beach, you've probably watched the tide go out. Seen here in super speed-up mode. But I'm betting you've never seen anything like this amazing footage of what happens on this beach in Australia. The lull between high tides becomes a race for survival as crabs emerge from the sand to quickly feed themselves before the tide washes back in. They've got to get while the getting's good. These fascinating creatures are sand bubbler crabs. They're using their pincers to bring sand grains to their mouth parts, which then sift out the food the ocean has deposited among the grains. They leave behind thousands of delicate sand spheres, a testament to their labors that will soon disappear in the next high tide. Here's an overview of their progress. Each lone scavenger attends to its own hunting ground, but huge parts of the beach are excavated. Other creatures choose to search for food together. These are soldier crabs, sweeping the beach in battalions. Working the beach by the hundreds, they march into one plot of land, exhaust it, and then march to the next. Similar to sand bubbler crabs, they scoop up sand with their front claws, sift out the food with their mouth parts and leave behind little pellets. I'm betting most armies would admire the soldier crab's swift, thorough and ferocious attack. Look at them tear up the beach looking for food, knowing that their enemy, the returning tide, is on its way back in. By the time the tide returns, the soldier crabs and the bubbler crabs are gone. Of course, the tide is really their friend. It's the tide that delivers those delicious micro tidbits of food that keep the crabs alive. And now, let us praise the humble dung beetle. In ancient Egypt, what we now know as the dung beetle, they called it a scarab, was worshipped. The ancient Egyptians believed that the scarab was a god that rolled the sun across the sky and buried it each evening, where it emerged the next morning, born anew. Today, you're much more likely to hear TV comics joking about dung beetles than find entire countries worshipping them. This is an outrage. Why? Because dung beetles are outstanding planetary citizens, performing a vital function. Dung is produced by animals we rely on for food, like uh, cows. Without dung beetles, there'd be a lot more dung. Millions and millions of tons more. And that would mean a few billion more flies. Dung beetles like these in Africa put their heads down, their bottoms up, and use their super strong front legs to roll away this dung, help deal with the fly problem, and recycle the dung for a positive purpose. Male and female dung beetles work together to assemble a suitable dung ball as the centerpiece of their new home. One beetle burrows under the earth to help the dung ball settle in. This aerates the soil and helps the nutrients in the dung ball nourish the earth. Once the dung ball is settled in, the female lays her eggs in the new burrow. When the eggs hatch, they feed on the dung and prepare to begin this valuable renewal of the earth all over again. Dung beetles have been around for 50 million years, with 7,000 species worldwide all united in their love of and need to possess balls of dung. One question about dung beetles for further study. Are they capable of having fun? You know, 
being frivolous? We're not privy to the thought process of dung beetles. However, watch this sequence and decide for yourself. Now, we all know what fun it is to go to a theme park and take some wild ride that makes us feel like we're out of control. Is this the dung beetle version of this same giddy urge? No safety harness, no crash helmet. Whoa, that was wicked cool. The humble dung beetle. Because of it, we live in a better, less smelly world. This is nature's equivalent to a small berserk lumberjack with a turbo-powered chainsaw. It's a leaf cutter ant. And no leaf in the canopy of this Borneo rainforest is too big for its sawtooth mandibles. It's not just leaves, of course. With their jaws vibrating 1,000 times per second, leaf cutter ants will happily slice, dice, and julienne flowers as well. If it grows and can be carried back to the nest, it's fair game. And as you can see, size is no object to these micro musclemen. Their job is to strip the tree and cart it back to the nest. And they do this with frightening efficiency. The path back to the nest becomes a veritable ant superhighway. And woe be any insect getting in the way of these infinitesimal beasts of burden. This forager crew takes all the foliage back to the nest and then heads out for another payload. Once inside, caretaker ants turn the leaves into a garden of fungus, which becomes ant food. But leafcutter ants aren't the only ones feasting on the abundance. In the upper reaches of this tropical rainforest, there's plenty left for everyone. If you're any kind of insect, the world is your salad bar. No matter how many friends show up, Mother Nature always seems to provide enough foliage for every species. And, like any good buffet, there's something for everyone. Every kind of bug, every kind of leaf. And you can eat it here, or, well, you can take it home and eat it. Hundreds of years ago, sailors thought octopi were sea monsters called devil fish, capable of dragging down ships. We know they're not devil fish, but we still don't know everything about them, including where they'll turn up next. We've created a plexiglass wonderland just so you can observe how amazing this creature really is, the octopus. Imagine that you're an octopus, like this cyania here. Your body has no bones, none. And what that means is that you'd be able to go almost anywhere you want to. Even if you happen to be a very large octopus, a 600 pounder say, you'd be able to squeeze yourself down so far, you could pass through a passageway no larger than a quarter. Since you don't have air bladders or gas pockets that would crush or implode at great depths, you can live at the very, very bottom of the ocean, where there's 15,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. A human being exposed to that kind of pressure would implode in a split second. Can you imagine how much fun it would be to be an octopus? You could go anywhere you want. Slide under a door, get into any room, you'd have a body unlike any other on Earth. If you get hungry, you could use one of your 240 suction cups to grab a meal. No matter how many yoga classes a human takes, he'll never be this flexible. That cloud you see is, in fact, a colossal swarm of thimble jellyfish, each no bigger than your thumbnail. 
These jellyfish are 95% water. They are, in a sense, separate from and a part of the sea at the same time. They've survived for 650 million years. And yet, they have no brain, no heart, no blood, no gills, and no complex nervous system. Somehow, they can taste, smell, and balance themselves, a fairly complex task. Not every jelly is so tiny. Luminous moon jellies, from some angles, look like huge cathedrals of light in the sea. From another angle, they look like the swaying hoop skirts of dancing mushrooms in an animated movie. 10,000 of them hang out together at a time. And just like the thimble jellies, there isn't one brain among them. And now, eight amazing facts about Baird's Taper, the intriguing animal you're gazing at this very moment. Number one, you may never have seen this animal before, but it's been here longer than we humans have. Its ancestors have been around for 35 million years. Number two, Baird's Taper is the official national animal of Belize, the country between Mexico and Guatemala. Number three, in Belize, it's called the mountain cow, although it's not a cow. It's really related to the horse and the rhinoceros. Number four, this is the only animal that has 14 toes, four on each front foot and three on each rear foot. Number five, tapers have a rubbery, highly flexible nose, perfect for eating leaves, fruit, and aquatic vegetation, which they do. Number six, the Baird's taper weighs up to 700 pounds. Number seven, their numbers are dwindling and they now face extinction because humans are destroying their habitat. And number eight, Baird's taper was named after a naturalist who mounted an expedition to Mexico in 1843. He brought back the skeletal remains of this species to America. And this was the first time it had been studied by scientists. So if you discover a new species, you might get to name it scientifically after yourself. But get busy. Tapers aren't the only species facing extinction. So are an unknown number of species yet to be discovered. We're here in the wilderness of the Rocky Mountains. Observing nature's impressive architects and engineers, beavers. By creating this pond, they're preventing soil from being washed away. And they're creating a place where new plants and insects can flourish. Beavers think ahead and secure their food supply long before they'll need it. They drag these branches into the water where they'll stay fresh and accessible during the winter freeze. Flash forward to the winter freeze, when the frigid temperature has turned the mud and sticks into a secure shelter for the beavers. Each dwelling houses a single beaver family. Yep, with a mom and dad, and did I mention beavers mate for life? And each home has an elegantly designed passageway to the lake. Beavers are North America's largest rodent, and they're the only ones with skin flaps behind their teeth that allow them to haul branches without swallowing water. Notice how neatly the beaver eats, stripping the bark by turning the branch like an ear of corn. They're strict but voracious vegetarians and can even digest the cellulose that most mammals just can't handle. Flash forward again to the following spring, and spring has sprung a leak in the dam. So dad stays with the young ones while mom and her eldest son fix it up. 
This is lucky for all the other animals around because virtually the entire ecosystem is dependent on the dam and the resulting pond. Wouldn't it be great if we could all be as industrious and efficient as the eager beavers? Spring has arrived, and a pod of beluga whales has migrated south to the Gulf of St. Lawrence for two reasons. They're looking for food, and they're looking for somewhere to molt. This gives us an extraordinary opportunity to take an up-close and personal look at this astonishing creature. Adult belugas are creamy white in color. They're born gray and slowly lighten to white over a period of five years. Male belugas weigh about 3,300 pounds and females about 3,000 pounds. Unlike most whales, belugas can use their necks to turn their heads nearly 90 degrees to the side. Notice there's no dorsal fin, as with most other whales. A dorsal fin might hinder their ability to swim for miles under Arctic ice, and it might let heat escape from the whale's body. The next remarkable aspect of belugas is how chatty they are. So chatty, they're called sea canaries. There's a lot more to beluga whale speech than just squeaks, squawks, and shrieks. Their sonar system may be the most sophisticated of any whale. It's kind of a natural version of the sonar used by a nuclear submarine. They bounce their clicks, screeches, and snorts off the shifting flows. This becomes a kind of 3D sound imaging that allows them to master their world. This sonar pulses from their rounded foreheads, called melons. The transmission is highly focused because the melon acts like an acoustical lens. Imagine that the sound waves are being projected like a beam of light, and you can almost see how the whale hears what's in front of it. This same sonar allows belugas to find the best places to surface and to find other belugas. They're very social whales, as you can plainly see. The migration of the belugas now lets us observe the spring molting process. Most of the year, belugas swim in salt water, but they've come here to this freshwater estuary to shed their skin. Fresh water absorbs more quickly than salt water, so the skin sheds faster. The rocky bottom of the estuary just adds to the exfoliation bliss of this springtime ritual. What allegedly separates humans from the so-called lower animals? Supposedly, it's the ability to make and use tools. However, as you can see here, these chimpanzees make tools and use them to enjoy a tasty nut meat meal. Baby chimps begin experimenting at a young age, like this one that's learning how to use a stick. Female chimps demonstrate how it's done. Females are markedly better at using tools than males, despite what the males might tell you in private. It takes 10 years for a young chimp to master the art of creating a tool and using that tool to produce an edible foodstuff. And if you think that's complicated, let this chimpanzee mom give a lesson in the fine art of finding and then eating safari ants. First, mom uses a wand selected and pruned for this delicate task. Now, the deal with safari ants is that they're a rich and delicious food source. But if you don't know how to eat them, they sting like crazy. Now, here's what not to do. Try to get safari ants, get frustrated, put hand in hole, and get stung not once, but twice. Now, here's how it's done. Get ants on a stick and gobble them down zippity-quick. These aren't the only tools that chimps have learned to use. This chimp uses a bone pick to get at some tasty marrow. 
here, a chimp uses a piece of fruit as a sponge to get every bit of sweetness from the pulp. And this chimp uses chewed leaves as a sponge to quench a raging thirst. Are we humans actually more advanced than chimps? Could you figure out how to eat safari ants without getting eaten alive? <laughs> Enough said. Now to shed some light on everyone's assumptions about the genetic basis for male behavior. In other words, guys like to show off. We just can't help ourselves. This group of chimpanzees is exhibiting behavior scientifically known as displaying. This means that males are playing Mr. Big Stuff to show the other males who is top chimp. Now, these chimps are unable to wear flashy suits, buy a football team, or drive a high-end convertible to show females what they're all about. Instead, they're reduced, or maybe we should say elevated, to this kind of display. If you were a female chimp, you would presumably be going wild right now. <laughs> yeah, right. In all dolphin species, young dolphins aren't born with the skills necessary to fend for themselves. In fact, the mortality rate for dolphin calves is 50% in the first year. What they are born with is the ability to mimic and mirror whatever their mother does. And this is how they learn to survive. The calf becomes mom shadow, imitating her every move, pose, posture, and action. If mom stands up on her tail, so does her calf. Come on, parents, don't you wish you could get this kind of cooperation? Of all the skills that mom has to teach Junior, the most important one is how to find food. She gives it instructions which sound like this. When fish hear her, they run for cover, burrowing themselves into the sand. The dolphins then utilize what's called echolocation, a kind of dolphin sonar system where their voice echoes back, giving them a clear idea of what fishy delights lie beneath the surface. As mom looks for food, her calf continues to mimic her every move. Another technique for the young ones to master Hydroplaning in the shallows. These dolphins rocket along at tremendous speeds. Their bodies half in and half out of the water. Now watch just how effective this technique is for catching fish. Oh, gotcha! Effective, yes, but not all dolphins have mastered the art of hydroplaning. And those who have get to show off a little. They toss the catch and play with it. And they parade it underwater, too. Now, why doesn't another dolphin try to grab it? This might be a ritual to establish trust. Or maybe the other dolphins just want to avoid getting in a fight. So this is the last thing the dolphin calf learns from Ma. Playing with your food is not only okay, it gives you status with your fellow dolphins. If there's anyone who thinks that only human beings can feel emotions like sorrow and grief, this footage will change your mind. An elephant family in Kenya's Amboseli National Park comes upon the bones of their own matriarch. As they tend to do whenever they encounter any elephant bones, the elephants first gather around the bones in a defensive circle. Then they turn the bones over, picking them up, feeling every crevice.
After this, they touch the bones with their hind feet. Scientists who have studied elephant behavior are certain that elephants experience deep emotions and have some understanding about death. Everything about the way these elephants are grieving here proves that point. As the sun goes down every evening in Northern Australia, millions of dark, huge winged creatures dominate the skies. They're an imposing sight, but these black flying foxes are just big harmless bats, the biggest in the world. Their wingspan can reach a whopping six feet. Given that the world's smallest bat species weighs less than a penny, that's pretty big. Nearly one quarter of the world's mammal species are bats. 160 of these are fruit bats. And 60 of these are called flying foxes for their unique looking fox-like faces. The black flying fox babies can't fly for the first month, which means the moms have to carry them, even when they become airborne. At night, they search for fruit and nectar, mainly through sight and smell. Like other fruit bats and vampire bats, black flying foxes don't rely on echolocation. During the day, they live in huge colonies or camps, housing up to 100,000 flying foxes. Usually, they stay relatively cool by roosting in mangrove and paper bark trees that sit in water. But sometimes, even this location isn't cool enough. Ever wear a black fur coat in the intense Australian heat? You can imagine why they fan themselves. And when that doesn't work, they lick themselves. They cool down a little as their saliva evaporates. But with 100,000 bats in the same grove of trees, things are bound to heat up. Fights often break out over which branch belongs to whom. They defend their turf, but they rarely break skin. Mostly, it's just a lot of noisy posturing. Posturing aside, this big black flying creature is nothing more than a fuzzy, foxy-looking vegetarian. These are gelata baboons and they're only found here in the Ethiopian highlands. They're the only primates native to high altitudes, and they're the only ones that graze on grass. Yeah, with the possible exception of certain fanatically vegan New York high fashion models. I wonder if the gelata baboon inspired Tina Turner's famous shag haircut during her What's Love Got To Do With It tour. Of course, only the male gelatas grow these manes. Gelata baboons like this one may have inspired the phrase nitpicking. Although why the phrase is nitpicking as opposed to nitpicking and eating is unclear. The gelata form larger groups than other species of primate. At times, bands of up to 600 baboons graze like herds of cattle on these African mountain slopes. But they're not territorial. So calling all gelata baboons Bring your nitpicking, big haired, grass eating families on up. There's plenty for everyone. Oh, baby elephant, you're such a hoot. You're so darn wrinkly and so darn cute. Whether clowning with your bestest bud or trying to climb out of the mud or wrestling on a dry lake bed, or playing with stuff on top of your head. You show us humans we've gone astray. Life is fun, come on, let's play. Don't be afraid if you feel a whim. Jump right in and take a swim. Find a pal and make
mix it up. And if you end up completely stuck, give one last push, one last big spring, then show your trunk and wave that thing. Now, these aren't your average, eat you as soon as look at you African crocodiles here. These are crocodiles spinning in a feeding frenzy, tearing apart an antelope. They're busy, to say the least, with a big job to do. Enter a hippo. Our hippo inexplicably starts to lick the bodies of the feeding crocodiles. Scientists haven't figured out why yet, but hippos seem to enjoy hanging with these bloodthirsty killers as they shred their victim and gorge on its flesh. Talk about insolence. Why do the crocs put up with this? Well, first of all, the hippos are no threat. They're vegetarian. Secondly, the hippos are more powerful than the crocs, so the crocs carry on as if the hippos aren't even there. And if you think this is bold, here's a baby hippo wading into a bevy of crocodiles. You know, it must be genetic. The baby hippo immediately starts gnawing on the spines of the croc's back. Now, this has got to be annoying, but, well, what are they going to do? Answer? Nothing. You want to know how hippos feel about the so-called danger of getting too close to a crocodile? Yeah, so I guess that about sums it up. If someone asks you to think of a magnificent hunter, chances are a lion's image would pop into your head. They have virtually no predators. The earth is their buffet table. Well, with at least one exception. This African crested porcupine is surrounded by young lion cubs. The adults are too smart to fool around with this small beast. Those quills may be modified hairs, but they are needle sharp, strong, and there are plenty of them. What the adults know is that porcupine needles can actually pierce the flesh of a lion, and these wounds could even kill it. Nevertheless, a porcupine is a juicy delicacy, and these curious cubs look for a way to get a paw under it, flip it, and attack. But the prickly porcupine fends off the cubs, and eventually, good sense wins out over hunger. The victorious porcupine moves off. Yeah, king of the jungle, big deal. This porcupine has to walk through a pride of adult lions. They're interested, but once again, those quills give the porcupine the equivalent of an impenetrable missile defense shield. <clears throat> uh, this pride of lions doesn't have much to be proud about today. What's the most interesting fact about meerkats? Probably not their interest in sunsets, like this one in the Kalahari Desert in Southern Africa. Lots of animals, even humans, would love a sunset like this. It might be the markings under their eyes. Did you know those dark markings act like sunglasses, allowing the meerkats to see in the harsh desert light? Here's another interesting fact. Since meerkats are perfect snack size for predators like eagles and jackals, one meerkat and sometimes more always stand guard for the mob. A mob of meerkats, that's actually the name used by naturalists, is a meerkat social group from five to 30 members. Here the mob gathers to observe the deadly puff adder. By the way, Meerkats are fiercely territorial and will fight to defend their turf from snakes or other meerkat mobs. Speaking of territorial, once they've staked out a territory, 
They use their four-digit claws to dig burrows and tunnels, where they'll sleep after a hard day of hunting. Meerkats grow to a length of 12 inches, weigh about two pounds, and are members of the mongoose family, just like the ones we saw earlier in this show. They like to wrestle. This habit begins at an early age. Interesting, but the most interesting fact about meerkats is what they love to eat. These cute little critters love to eat scorpions. They're immune to the venom. First, the meerkat bites off the stinger. Good move. And then it's time to tie on the feed bag. If scorpions aren't available, meerkats will also dine on anything they can overpower. Beetles, spiders, even lizards and small rodents. But for a meerkat, nothing beats the crunchy goodness of a freshly killed scorpion. And who can argue? Although, well, a little ketchup might help. The African rainforest is filled with all kinds of odd and fascinating creatures. This long tongue belongs to an okapi, who uses it to grab food. The five-foot-tall okapi feeds on leaves. It breaks down the tree limbs so that the limbs won't grow up and out of its reach. Scientists didn't even know about the okapi until the 20th century. What is it? Its legs have markings somewhat like a zebra, which give it cover in the jungle. But its face is much more like its relative, the giraffe. Its neck may not be nearly as long, but like the giraffe, it spreads its legs to take a drink. Unlike the giraffe, the okapi is extremely rare. Be glad you caught a glimpse of this one. If you're a river otter in Yellowstone National Park, you're all about finding new ways to play. Frolicking in an otter pile? Oh, well, that's fun. But not as much fun as sliding. Ice sliding is about as good as it gets in otterdom. Sometimes it takes two, even three tries to get a good solid slide. An otter has the perfect body for this freeform sport. Designed for streamlined swimming, its head and tail taper into a slender body. But they also make the most of that streamlining on land because they slide around at every opportunity. When they're frolicking around, they seem to always end up in water. These otters have an amazing fur coat with an inner layer that traps air, keeping frigid water off their skin. And, like all extreme sports enthusiasts, otters are willing to go to great lengths for the perfect slide. And here it is, the perfect slide, a group slide. Here's a family of otters rollicking down a mountainside for no other reason than it's one heck of a lot of fun. These otters can reach speeds as great as 15 miles an hour on their way to the bottom. Human beings often pay hundreds of dollars to get into theme parks and go on rides that aren't any more fun than this. And Otterland is 100% absolutely free. love to pretend that we're showing you this footage of a baby chimp in Tanzania being playful and adorable because we have some scientific explanation about how playfulness in chimp babies mirrors playfulness in human babies. That very well may be true. In fact, it's almost certainly true. But the fact is, we're showing you this footage because it's cute and fun to watch. Is that so wrong? Yeah, we don't think so.
rats are running amok. But generally here in India, they're not reviled the way they can be in the United States. In fact, to many in India, rats are sacred. 80% of the Indian population is Hindu. And in the Hindu religion, rats are believed to be companions of the god Ganesh. Rats are admired and revered for their cunning and adaptability. And it goes against the religion of many Indians to kill them. Hence, well, the rats reproduce at such a ferocious rate, they can't be contained, stopped, or even slowed down. Let's do the math. Each mother rat can have up to 12 babies in a litter. She can have a litter a month, 144 babies a year. Her babies will start having babies two months after they're born, and those babies will start having babies two months after that. One couple, just one, can produce 15,000 descendants in a year. So where are all these rats going to live? in burrows that have to be dug out and expanded and remodeled constantly, which is what helps keep the rat's teeth from growing too long. Of course, with all these tunnels comes the accidental meeting of two alpha males. Both rats survive the scuffle, which might mean another 30,000 rats by next year. Holy rodent. This is the amazing Australian Sugar Glider. The Sugar Glider is a marsupial with a gliding membrane that runs down the side of its body and a tail it uses like a rudder. When it stretches its membranes, it could possibly leap the length of a football field. The Sugar Glider smears its scent on branches, blazing an invisible trail for its kin to follow. Their quest? To find nourishing nectar to nosh. They also like tree sap, insects, pollen, and seeds. By gliding and dining by night, they're safe from most predators. Their internal clock lets them know when dawn is coming, so they can be back in their nests before the sun appears on the horizon. This is all about the astonishing agility that Gibbon show as they swing amid the viney tendrils of the Borneo jungle. But before you swing, you've got to power up. A fresh fruit snack will do nicely. And uh, fruit doesn't get any fresher than this, right off the tree and uh, right down his chest. As you can see, these gibbons are very agile. There's even a word to describe what's happening right here. If one gibbon were to invite another to swing from tree to tree, he might say, hey, you want to go brachiating? Gibbons have been known to leap 30 feet in a single jump. To brachiate like a gibbon, you'd have to become arboreal meaning, like Gibbons, you'd have to live in trees. Sorry, that's just the way it is. Welcome once again to our semi-irregular, non-serious series, So You Want to Be a Bear Cub. Lesson one, how to climb a tree. Now, climbing trees is something that all young bear cubs must do. If you want to be a bear cub, you must not merely observe. You must learn by doing. In fact, you might call this a, well, a uh, <clears throat> crash course. If you persist, 
like these black bears. And combine instinct with courage and vigorous employment of claws, you will eventually succeed, which will lead to many long, happy arboreal adventures. Lesson two, how to locate and consume food. Come on, sleepyhead. There's a whole winter for hibernating. Time to go in search of edibles. The woods are full of delicious treats like these blackberries. And one must pluck these delights where and when one finds them. However, for the real meal deal, aha, the hornet's nest, jam-packed to the outer walls with delicious larvae full of fat and protein. Of course, getting at the larvae without turning into a welt-covered hornet pincushion requires a bit more cunning and finesse than is being shown here. We recommend beating a hasty retreat and figuring out a strategy, uh, such as the clever knock down the branch with the nest and slide your belly on top of it strategy. Now the nest is down, your tummy is protected, and it's time to eat. And once you've done all the hard work, you're sure to make plenty of friends at the dinner table. Finally, lesson three, how to find a hibernation hidey hole. As winter approaches, you, Mr. Bear Cub, must find a suitable hole for hibernation. As you can see, this might be more difficult than it first appears. Now here is a victory of enthusiasm over practicality. Here, a bear cub has consumed a bit too much hornet larvae to find a good fit. But at last, he finds a comfy home. This ends this edition of So You Wanna Be a Bear Cub. Tune in next time when we'll reveal how to climb a tree when you're bigger than the tree. This is no ordinary snake. What makes it so unusual is not its ability to slither up a tree like this. Many snakes are able to use their belly scales to push against tree bark, allowing them to undulate upwards. No, what makes this tree snake so unusual is its interest in, well, one might say passion for, becoming airborne. These are flying snakes. They fly from tree to tree. Why? Well, probably because here in Indonesia, it's the quickest, most efficient way to get from here to there. The snake flattens its body into a ribbon shape, launches itself, and then swims through the air. Actually, since the snake can't fly upward, it might better be called a parachuting snake. Of course, two can play at this flying game. This is the flying dragon lizard. The snake's interest in the flying dragon lizard is entirely culinary. He wants to eat it. The flying dragon puffs itself up as a warning. The snake seems unimpressed, or at least undaunted. I mean, a meal is a meal, is a meal. Sorry, gotta fly. On either side of the dragon's body are thin, wing-like folds of skin supported by five to seven ribs that extend from the body. With its wings extended, it's capable of flying for distances of up to 30 feet. If the snake is a parachutist, the dragon is a glider. Ooh, nice flight and great landing and terrific self-rescue. Northern Australia is a hotbed of exotic animals, including the frilled lizard. The frill is that rough-like collar it uses to bluff its enemies, like feral cats. Now, here's the frill at half staff. Look, let's go all the way with this thing. Let's pretend you're a predator. Are you ready to see the frilled lizard in full scare mode? Okay, collar boy, let's see what you got. Hey, hey, watch it. As you can see, the whole point of this exercise was to get the frilled lizard on the run. 
because a frilled lizard on the run is one of nature's most offbeat, entertaining sights. I mean, check out that leg action. The way it runs, pumping its back legs akimbo, has earned it the name Bicycle Lizard. The point of the scary frill is to give the lizard enough time to beat a hasty retreat, rocketing up the nearest arboreal loft. What are you looking at? The surface of some strange planet? The breastplate of some kind of mutant science fiction dinosaur? No, you're looking at the skin of one of the most bizarre of Australia's many magnificent lizards, the Thorny Devil. We nominate the Thorny Devil as the lizard most in need of a spa treatment. We mean the whole program. Sea salt scrub, mud bath, kelp wrap, hydrotherapy, and the world's longest, deepest facial. I mean, there's rough, scaly skin, and there's rough, scaly skin. As fearsome as this creature looks, just remember that the thorny devil is only four to six inches long. One of its most fascinating features is how it consumes water. It maneuvers through dewy landscapes and arranges for water to fall on itself. This water runs down micro grooves on its back. By working its jaws like this, the thorny devil is actually working those grooves so the water runs into its mouth. Another thorny devil feature is its false head. When threatened, the thorny devil will hide its real head, leaving this scaly knob exposed. That defense, plus the thorns that give it its name, keeps this guy safe to stalk and consume his one and only foodstuff. Ants, up to 3,000 ants in a single meal. Wash down with a healthy gulp of water off its own backside. Do elephants grieve for dead relatives? A, probably true. B, probably false. C, only if encouraged by humans. Or D, only if from a spiritual herd. The correct answer is A, probably true. If there's anyone who proves that point. What animal consumes and makes its home in other animals, uh, poop? A, the rat. B, the fly. C, the dung beetle. Or D, the hornet. What do baby dolphins learn from their mothers? A, how to hunt. B, how to use sound waves. C, how to stand on their tails. Or D, all of the above. The correct answer is D, all of the above. In all...